Welcome back to ECE 441A, 541A. Homework number six was due Friday, and so homework seven now, I gave you the weekend off since you may have been doing something relative to homecoming, but homework number seven will be due right before exam number three. Exam three is in a couple of weeks, actually less than that. It's on the 21st of November, and that will be covering the material on homework six and seven. It's basically root focus, construction, and design. And I'll try to make some exam number three material available like I have in the past. Lab number three is coming soon. You really can't do it until we talk about design in terms of output feedback design. You did some design actually in lab number two. You were feeding back position and velocity. You had full state available and you used that to modify your input. And in so doing, you were actually performing some control. Now what we're doing is we're saying, well, we may not have full state feedback available. We maybe only have one output, maybe the output available to us to feedback. And now we have to filter that or adjust that or design some kind of compensation strategy to overcome the lack of having everything available to measure and feedback. If you're in 541A, I hope to get that project posted shortly, and we'll move on from there. That will be due near the end of the semester, your project for 541. Here's where we're going. We're now moving from Chapter 7 into Chapter 10, and sections of Chapter 10 dealing with controller design specifically for or using the root locus approach. That was why we spent quite a bit of time trying to understand the rules for the root locus because we'll actually be needing those concepts to help us figure out how to build these compensators or controllers. So we're emphasizing or we're focusing on this red block in our block diagram. We have our traditional system configuration. G of S is our system. H of S might be our feedback dynamics. A lot of times that will simply be one. And what we want to do is if we're not happy with the way the system is performing or behaving without that G sub C, how do we build a G sub C? And this is where I have jokingly said we pull out our shakers. We now go into the cabinet and we get our pole shaker and our zero shaker and we start sprinkling those onto the S plane in a pattern that will provide us with a closed loop system behavior that we're more liking or that we like better. So let's illustrate this with an example, but really now what you want to think about is how do we build up this G sub C of S, and that could be as simple as a gain, K. It could be a little bit more complex. It could have a gain, a pole factor, and a zero factor, or it might be even more complex than that. It might be a second order. It might be a PID controller, where we have now a proportional integral and derivative term. And that's actually, we will in lab number three be looking at G sub C of S being a phase lead controller, which is just a gain, a zero factor, and a pole factor, and a PID controller, which has now three terms in it. Let's now look at an example. Suppose we have, and since we're maybe starting some new material as far as controller design, let's connect that with something we're really comfortable with. And the system that I think you better know very intimately is our 
mass spring damper system, but now let's forget the spring. Let's just throw it away. Let's disconnect the spring. We now just have a mass and a dash pot with, let's say, the ability to measure the position of that mass. So you could think of this as mass in some kind of fluid or heavy fluid. It has some damping, but there's no spring. It's not connected to a spring, but it does have some damping. So if you had a shock absorber, it just has the fluid in it, and it doesn't have this spring in it, if you were thinking that way. Or in our lab, simply remove your spring that you had in play. So think of mass... in heavy oil or fluid. In the time domain, what do these system dynamics look like? Again, we're trying to start from something we know and progress towards something new. What in the time domain governs the dynamic behavior of this mass damper system? What are the equations of motion? Pardon? Okay, so now we have F is equal to MA, don't we? Newton's second law. And we have how many forces? Oh, I better put another force in here. We didn't have any way of controlling that before. Let's say that we're now applying a force U that is in the direction that we've now labeled X to be going positively. In this case we can think of the dynamics of this system as the force U is now being opposed by the inertial force, mx double dot, and the damping force, which is proportional to velocity. That's what we have in the time domain. F is equal to ma, essentially. Our forces external are the applied U of T and the damping, and MA is MX double dot. To obtain a transfer function, that's pretty straightforward. We can simply Laplace transform that second order differential equation. We now have U of S, and I'm going to go ahead and factor out the x of s in one step so that we now have our Laplace transformed or frequency domain description of the same system. U of s is now our input, or it always has been, but in this representation, capital U of s is an input, that's not the step. Laplace transform of a step. This is just some generic Laplace transform of our input waveform. And X is what we will consider our output. And that, in fact, for this system, is our position variable. We can now create the transfer function between the input and the position. or divide both sides by that expression that scales capital X of S, and we end up with factoring out one of the S's that's common to both terms, S times the quantity SM plus B. We are trying to just play with a system to get comfortable with this idea of controller design, we're not really focusing on a specific system, so let's make it somewhat clean by letting our mass be 1 and our damping constant B be 1. Now we have a transfer function, G of S, with some pretty clean factors. We have a pole at the origin and a pole at minus one. That's now our open loop system, capital G of S. We said we're moving into chapter 10, which is controller design. Now 
what you will be confronted with many times are somebody design specifications or someone telling you this is what I want your system to achieve or accomplish. Suppose they now say I want a 2% settling time less than or equal to one second and suppose that they also say a percent overshoot less than 20 percent. That's what they want in their closed loop system to accomplish a settling time, a 2% settling time less than or equal to one second and a percent overshoot less than 20 percent and this is our open loop system which is a mass damper system, a mass and a dash pot without any spring with the mass and the dash pot both having values of one. What does this look like? Or how do we approach it? And if you were listening at the very beginning, I said we're doing design, controller design, with a specific tool. And what tool were we using? What did we just do for homework six? What did you learn how to do? Sketch root locus. So now we're wanting to do the controller design using a root locus approach. Let's now start that process for this particular case. Here is our S plane, or we could, before we even begin to sketch the root locus, we should be able to translate these design specs. This is Now we're into the fun part because now we're putting all of this that we've learned all semester together to allow us to create or build these G sub C of S's. I know everything was fun up to this point, but now it's even more fun. How do we translate these design specifications into locations in the complex S plane? How does the 2% settling time translate into this diagram? Do you remember? And if you don't, you will by exam number three hopefully be able to do this. We had a settling time spec, T sub S. It's a 2% settling time. How many time constants does that correspond to? Four. So our settling time says we have four tau, or if we're dealing with a first order or a second order system, we know that the real parts have to have some sigma value into the left half plane, and sigma is reciprocally related to the time constant tau. We now know that four over sigma needs to be less than or equal to one, and now we can say that sigma needs to be greater than or equal to 4. And if we now translate that now we need to be to the left of that vertical line at minus 4 with our closed loop poles, our dominant poles in our closed loop system. What about the percent overshoot spec? That was supposed to be less than 20 percent. And do you have figure 5.8 memorized? You should have at least the notion of that figure mentally in mind as far as what I don't even want to attempt fate, but somewhere in here I do have figure 5.8, but, oh, there it is. <laughs> Here's figure 5.8, and which part of this figure are we interested in? It's this line right there. That's the relationship between percent overshoot and zeta. That's what that crazy formula does that has this square root with the natural logs of percent overshoot over 100. It just mathematically models that functional form. 
if we now want a 20% overshoot, if we were just doing this on the back of an envelope, we would say, oh, here's what we need. We need to be having a zeta value of about 4.5. That wasn't too hard. So now we say a 20% overshoot, and you could do this on the calculator with that equation. You could now find the zeta value as 0.45. What's that zeta value of 0.45? How do we translate that? What's the next piece of this process? Yes, so now this will produce an angle theta. The inverse cosine of zeta is our theta value, the limit or the lower value of that. And here, zeta of 0.45 would give us a specific angle. We need our angle theta to be less than 63 degrees if we did the inverse cosine of 0.45. If zeta, if percent overshoot was 5%, that gives you a zeta of percent overshoot of 5%, zeta of 0.7, so an angle of 45 degrees. Those are some sort of markers that you might be thinking about. Now we don't have to how we get a bigger pizza wedge or pie wedge versus 45 degrees. Now we can go, and again, I said you could have what at your disposal for the next exam? A protractor. You could now bring out your protractor. I know you didn't see that on the video, but you can pull that out of your pocket with your slide rule and your pocket protector, and now this is 63 degrees. Now, where do we want our dominant poles to live to satisfy these two performance specifications? There's many different places. There's a triangle from the origin up 63 degrees and down that minus four vertical. There's a nice little triangle. Do we want to live in there? Do we want to live to the above that 63 degree line, in between that and the J omega? Do we want to live to the left of the vertical line at minus 4, above or below the angle line? These are all potential pieces that are now identified by the sketching of these performance specifications. Typically, we want a percent overshoot inside our angle. So now we want that dominant pole location to be located inside that 63 degree angle. And we want the, per the settling time faster than one second. So that means we're going further into the left half plane. We now would like our dominant poles and now I'm just cross-hatching up to that line, angular line of 63 degrees. Is it clear that what I'm shading? This is the allowable spot. And now there's an infinite number of correct solutions. That's why sometimes you feel a little uncomfortable as students first learning this. You go, well, where do I pick my poles? You've got a big region shaded. Anywhere in that region will theoretically satisfy the specifications for this class. So given a class of 65, I could have 65 different correct answers. Is that clear? Now, what happens for our particular system? We have a system given by 1 over s times s plus 1, and we would like for the closed-loop poles of that system to be in that shaded region. That's the idea. Let's now sketch the root locus, and a lot of times I will say the uncompensated root locus. What I'm meaning is 
sketch the root locus of this system, the open loop system, without any additional poles and zeros that you might speculate are there. Sketching the root locus, what's one of our first things that we do? Rule one, poles and zeros. How many zeros do we have? Finite. Zero, so we don't have to worry about drawing circles, do we? How many x's do we have? How many open loop poles? Two. And we have those now located at the origin and minus one. And I hope that you already see the root locus for this pattern of poles. And a lot of times by this point in the semester, people are doing this. They're clapping their hands and then going vertical because they know what's happening with this pattern of poles and zeros. It's come, they're both approaching each other. You only have two poles, no zeros. They're coming together. They meet exactly in the middle, and then they break away at the asymptote angles of plus and minus 90 degrees. That's coming to us from some subsequent rules. If we now look at phi sub a, for example, that's this 180 degrees divided by p minus c times 2l plus 1, where l is going from 0 up to p minus z minus 1. p is 2, z is 0, or this is now 180 divided by 2, that's our base angle, our fundamental angle of the asymptote, and then this is going to be times this 2L plus 1, and that's going to give us 90 degrees and 270 degrees for our asymptotes, with L equal 0 and 1. And where is where are those asymptotes going to be located? At the centroid. How do we compute this? This is just the sum of our poles minus the sum of the zeros, which we don't have, divided by the pole zero excess. Those asymptote angles are located at the centroid of minus one half. We can now come over or go back to our diagram and sketch the root locus of our system, G of S, with just a gain. This is, if we now just have a gain, capital K, this is what we could achieve by adjusting that gain between zero and infinity. And I hope it's clear that at this point, we really cannot satisfy the design specification with just this system and a output feedback gain, K. Nowhere does that root locus get into that shaded region for no value of gain K. But we could design a controller. It's just not going to satisfy our specifications. What if we did try to design just a gain-based controller? G sub C of S is just a gain, K. What is possible, and you can see it just from the root locus, what's possible. What is possible with gain say adjustment or simply selecting a value of k and not introducing any controller poles 
or zeros. Our g sub c of s, now let's just see what we can do with just a gain k. And the root locus tells us all the possibilities. But let's now just determine a gain k. How does somebody do that? The first thing you'll want to do if somebody says, oh, just build me a controller with a gain k, now can you design or can you select a dominant set of poles? Can you pick closed loop poles with just a gain controller? Again, the possibilities are limitless. You have an infinite number of closed loop poles. They all live on that blue root locus diagram. You could pick closed loop poles maybe at maybe one at minus a quarter, and because of symmetry, because you have two, your other pole would be at minus three fourths. You could maybe pick them both at minus one half. Which one of those two, a pole at minus one fourth and a pole at minus one half, which of those are associated with a higher value of gain k? So we have two possibilities, right? We have a one answer and another answer. If I said I want a closed loop pole at minus one fourth. And I want to, and then a second design is I want another design that has a closed loop pole at minus one half. Which of those two designs will result in a bigger k value? Pardon? K is zero at the poles, isn't it? K of zero is our open loop design. Basically, we don't worry about closing the feedback path. As we increase the gain k, what happens to our closed loop poles? They move along that root locus in the direction of the arrows. If I crank up the gain k with my knob a little bit, I will get to a closed loop pole, one being at minus one fourth. The other one is coming in from the minus one location, trying to approach the one that's going to the left. There's one coming to the right. Then I crank up the gain a little bit more to get what? Both of them at minus one half. Is it clear that the gain would have to be bigger if I wanted my closed loop poles at minus one half versus wanting them at one of them at minus one fourth? Suppose, just for illustration purposes, somebody says, oh, you know what, let's put the closed loop poles right here at minus one half plus and minus J2, just for grins. Let's just, I just say on an exam, put your closed loop poles at minus one half plus and minus J2. And what if your root locus didn't pass through that? What would you say on the exam? It's not possible with this choice of configuration. You would have to do something different. In this case, we know that we're right at minus one half and we can be anywhere in J omega land. We just have to decide where we want to be. Here I've just for illustration said suppose we let our dominant poles of the closed loop system, S sub delta, be at minus one half plus and minus J2. Is it clear how that can be selected or why that is a potential solution? That point or points live on the root locus. Those are valid closed loop poles. Now, how do we find the gain k to get us there? How do we adjust the gain k? And you probably don't want to just start plugging in numbers to your calculator and hope that you iterate 
to the right gain value. But you could, couldn't you? You could say, oh, let me try k of a fourth. Let me try k of three fourths. Let me try k of two. Oh, this is frustrating. How do you find k? We have the magnitude condition, don't we? So now we have the magnitude condition. The magnitude condition will allow us to actually find a gain value that will put us right at that particular closed loop pole location. We know that k, g of s, is equal to 1 if it's on the root locus, if our s is on the root locus. For our system, that now says we have k, s, s plus 1, that magnitude is equal to 1. We can solve that for k, and since we don't have any zero factors, we just have this product of pole factors. And what do we want to do? Well, we actually know what value of s we want to have when, for our k value. We know that s, we want to be s delta, which is minus 1 half plus j2. You'll get the same thing if you try minus 1 half minus j2. And what are we doing? We're actually computing. Now you could get out your other tools from your toolkit. You could get out your dividers and you could measure. Or you could get out your ruler and you could measure from the origin to that S delta. Minus 1 half plus J2. Let's say that's now a length L sub T0. What I'm saying there is you would, could come over here and you could measure that distance, that distance is L sub T sub 0. That's just a hypotenuse of a right triangle where one side is a half and the other side is 2. And you can find that length on your calculator. Square root of 1 half squared plus 2 squared. Then you can find this length. And those are supposed to be straight lines. And this line let's say, is L sub T sub 1. Is it clear what I'm saying or what we're doing? Now we can physically find K. If we do it the long way, I have minus 1 half plus J2, the absolute value or the length of that line. I also have minus 1 half plus J2 plus 1. Those are my two lengths, which if I multiply those out, I get exactly, I have now minus one-half plus J2 and one-half plus J2. Those have exactly the same distance or length. And when I multiply them together, I get rid of the square or the square root, and now I have one-fourth plus four or now I have four and a quarter for my gain k. Which says then that a g sub c of s, a controller equal to k equal to 4.25 yields closed loop poles at minus one half plus and minus j2. Now you go whistling into your boss's office and you go, I have it, I have a design. Whistling. And your boss goes, what's your settling time for this design that you've now come up with? You go, oh, let me calculate it. It's 4 tau. Or 4 over sigma. What's your sigma now? 1 half. 
Now you cut your whistle in midstream. And what's your settling time? Eight seconds. We knew going in that that root locus did not even approach the shaded region, so we had no hope of it satisfying our design specs. But now your boss is saying, hmm, no, you need to do better than that. Eight seconds, and I wanted one. So you need to speed up your system a little bit. Does everybody understand what we've done so far? Now what we need to do is we need to drastically modify that open loop root locus. We're now answering the question, how can we satisfy the original design specs, which were a settling time 2% of less than or equal to one second and a percent overshoot less than 20%. If we go back and we look at our system open loop with just a gain control where it's hopeless, isn't it? We're not going to meet it. We have to drastically change that root locus. And to drastically change the root locus, we need to introduce, pull out of the cabinet, our pole shaker and our zero shaker. We now need to have some poles and zeros in addition to just a gain. And the particular pattern of poles and zeros that we'll sprinkle onto our S-plane, in this case, has a particular term or phrase or structure if we are trying to drastically change or modify the root locus, which we have to, then this is begging us to implement a phase lead controller. We now want to not only have a gain, but we also want to have a zero factor and a pole factor. And for a phase lead controller, the magnitude of that zero is less than the magnitude of the pole. They're both going to be stable. So if we just sketched these, whoops wanted that to be blue, then we have our zero there and we have our pole there. That's a phase lead pole zero pattern. Our zero is closer to the imaginary axis than our pole is and they're both in the left half plane. That's a phase lead control. What we now need to do is pick that Z and P to dramatically change the original root locus so that the compensated system has a root locus pattern that passes through or into the desired shaded area. Let's see if we can do that. If we go back to what we had, Oh my. We had a vertical line at minus four, and we had an angle of 63 degrees. We began with poles there. Can you think of a strategy or another pole zero pattern that would produce a root locus that ended up in this shaded region over here? We're trying to be so we have the mirror image down here. 
we're trying to be in this shaded space. And we have the opportunity now to put a zero and a pole down in the complex S plane. So now we need to put down a zero and a pole somewhere. Well, let me give you a little tip. And you have to take this tip not to an extreme, but a lot of times it's easier if you actually cancel one of your existing poles or zeros. If we drop that zero down right on top of the pole, and you can only do that if your pole and zero that you're canceling are in the left half plane. Now we need to figure out where the pole is. But let's just say now that we let z equal 1, or we've now put a controller 0 at s equal minus 1. What have we done? We've actually canceled the open loop pole at s equal minus 1. And here is the caveat. Let me do it in red. Never, never cancel a pole or a zero, meaning you could flop a pole down to cancel zero, but never do this on the j omega axis or in the right half plane. If you want to lose 200 points out of a possible 20, you do that. Okay, so don't do this. If you have poles and zeros in the right half plane, you can put poles and zeros in the right half plane, you just can't cancel poles and zeros in the right half plane. Is that clear? You can put you can create an unstable system or a controller. You can put a pole in the right half plane. Just don't use that pole to cancel a zero over there. Now, we don't have to do that here. We just had to cancel a zero that was in the left half plane. Where do I locate a pole so that my root locus, both poles on my root locus will be inside the shaded region? knowing what you now know about root locus diagram. Where do you want the breakaway point? To the left of minus 4, right? You want your breakaway, you want those asymptotes to be breaking away to the left of minus 4. What does that tell you about the pole location? It needs to be to the left of minus 8, doesn't it? So now what we want is we want, for this design, we want a breakaway to the left of s equal minus 4. I'm having trouble with my 4s. Which says that we want p in magnitude to be bigger than 8. Now, we're doing this on the back of an envelope. We're trying to do this over a cup of coffee. Let's just pick a nice number. P equals 10 is to the left of 8, isn't it? Or bigger than 8. So what's my controller look like? I've now already put together two of the three pieces of this controller. I haven't yet picked K, but I have picked a 0 at minus 1, and I have located my pole at 10. Now I have a combination of my controller and the plant 
it's now k s plus 1 s plus 10 times 1 over s s plus 1. That gets canceled. You can now see that I hope the sigma sub a is going to be what for this compensated system? It's going to be the sum of my poles, which I have a minus 10, I have a 0, and I actually could say I have a minus 1 if I wanted to. If I include that minus 1, I need to include it in my zeros. I now have a 3 poles and 1 0, or I now have minus 10 over 2, which you already knew. You now have minus 5 for your centroid of your breakaway points, halfway between the origin and minus 10. You located your compensator pole at minus 10. Now, where do you want to put your dominant poles? You have an infinite number of possibilities. You just want to crank up your gain so that the rightmost pole gets to the left of minus 4. So you could have two real unequal poles, one to the in between minus 4 and minus 5, and the other one between minus 5 and minus 6. But you might want it to be a little faster, your system, and you can tolerate a little overshoot. So why don't we just go with minus 5 plus and minus j5. What's the overshoot for that? We have a pure two-pole system now because the pole and the zero canceled. What's our angle, theta? 45. We now have an overshoot of 5%, which is better than 20%. We can use the magnitude condition to find our unknown k in our controller. We now have k, s plus 1 over s plus 10, times 1 over s, s plus 1. We don't have to mess with those. They're canceled. So now we have k is equal to s, s plus 10, and we need that at minus 5 plus j5. And that's simply minus 5 plus j5, minus 5 plus j5 plus 10. Or again, we have the same 5 plus j5 effectively squared. Or we now have 5 squared plus 5 squared, or 50. We've now designed our controller. We now have a g sub c equaling 50 s plus 1 over s plus 20. Whoa, where did that come from? s plus 10. I don't know, I just was doubling something for whatever reason. Shouldn't have been. We've now designed a controller, and you can implement that with some op amps, resistors, and capacitors if you wanted to. What kind of a controller is it? phase lead, because our zero is to the right of our pole. Question. So now the question is a good question. The question concerns what if, or is this design robust? How much time do we have? So what did we just do? We just put in our pole over here at minus 10, didn't we, if I fill this in. The question is, you maybe don't have your system modeled very well. Maybe your pole is not really at minus 1. Maybe it's at minus 0.9, or maybe it's at minus 1.1, and you've now located your controller pole, or 0, right at minus 1. Well, I... encourage you to play, right? We're supposed to be having fun. So now your boss says, well, we don't know that that pole's going to be right at minus 1. Maybe it's at minus 1.1. What's your design going to do? Well, you're going to say, well, I put it at minus 1, and I still have this at minus 10. These are 
very well determined. This is what you're building. What's the root locus of this look like? This guy comes here, right? And what's the other one do? Right? So you're going to be close to your desired places right here at minus 5 plus and minus J5 close, but you will have a third pole right there. And so that could, depending on how big your gain is, that's going to slow things down a little bit, but your dominant behavior is still going to be determined by the, the triangles that are complex conjugate, but you will maybe approach those a little more slowly because of that triangle that's stuck. But you still have a fairly decent design. We'll pick up close to there on Wednesday.